A few months before I started this channel, this is how Jeff Bezos opened a presentation that he gave covering his vision for the future, his opinions as to what it was going to take in order to get humanity off the planet and to create a self-sustaining community elsewhere, and why it was so absolutely vital to do so. He began the presentation much like this, much like many presentations are started when we're talking about spaceflight, the accomplishments of the past, and just how inspiring these things are. However, he later moved on to start talking about how living on other planets in the solar system is not a viable way for us to continue. He talks about Mars being substantially smaller, therefore not having a great deal of surface area for us to colonize in the first place, but also because it's so incredibly distant and also doesn't have the same gravity. With those arguments, amongst others, he made the case that really what we need to do is live in space as opposed to living on another planet. And this is his vision for the future, and not just his vision, but the vision of many other science fiction writers and visionaries of the past, the O'Neill Cylinder, a colossal orbital station capable of providing for a million inhabitants with artificial gravity and a beautiful environment presumably exported from Earth, along with the future of our species. And that future would be to export heavy industry off of Earth where it is so damaging and put it in space along with these O'Neill cylinders. You would have normal gravity provided by artificial gravity from centrifugal force, so you wouldn't have to worry about that, and also it would be in Earth orbit, so you wouldn't have to worry about the colossal distances involved. There seem to be lots and lots of advantages to this. However, in my opinion, and I intend to prove this to you, Jeff Bezos is wrong in many important respects about just how viable this solution is, and just how good of a solution it is for the future of our species. When critics of colonizing the solar system talk about an escape valve for the uber-rich, an O'Neill cylinder is just that. Whereas when we're talking about a multi-planetary species, an O'Neill cylinder, unfortunately, is not that. And I'm going to explain exactly why that's the case in just a moment. The Earth is finite, and if the world economy and population is to keep expanding, space is the only way to go. This is something that Jeff Bezos said when he was still in high school, and I happen to think that he was absolutely correct about this. During his presentation, he also talked about our current energy needs, and many of you have may have heard that if we simply covered all of the state of Nevada with solar panels, that would be able to take care of our current current energy needs. However, he also talked about the fact that our energy requirements are growing by 3% per year, and in a mere two centuries, we would have to cover the entire surface of the planet in solar panels. Obviously, that's something that we can't do. And as the vast populations of the third world start becoming like the rest of us and start consuming as much energy, our requirements are simply going to 
to be far beyond the capability of this planet. And the only way to save this planet is to start exporting our population and perhaps the industry that goes with it off the planet and go someplace else. However, he also said that going to Mars is just not going to be practical. Once again, too far away. Its surface area is only about the same as the land mass that we have available to us here on Earth. So not a very good option and also the gravity being a problem as well, at least in his opinion. But right from the get-go, there are problems with this argument. First of all, distance. Yes, currently it does take a tremendous amount of time to go from Earth to Mars, although not nearly as long as he's been talking about. We're talking a year's worth of transit time at most, maybe six months or so with our current chemical rockets. And if we start using nuclear thermal engines, which by the way, are going to make their debut in 2026, then we're cutting that transit time down to about three months. Also, he said that there's only a single launch window once every 22 months to go to Mars. This is also not true. There are two available launch windows. The second, making use of the gravitational well of Venus and making use of the slingshot effect to accelerate the spacecraft towards Mars while it's at apogee instead of perigee. Well, almost at apogee, but nevertheless, a totally different route that doesn't really consume any more time. And not only that, it gives the spacecraft the alternative of carrying out an abort if absolutely necessary while performing the Venus flyby and returning to Earth in a matter of a couple of months. This is actually an alternative that the direct route to Mars doesn't offer. So really, we have two launch windows, not one. And if we have nuclear thermal propulsion, which we are almost certainly going to have by the time we really get serious about going to Mars, we're going to be able to reduce our transit time, at least where human beings are concerned, down to 90 days at most. Now, there are other things to consider when we're talking about the distance from Earth to Mars. And the most important of these is security. If you are tens of millions of kilometers away from Earth and you really want to create a multi-planetary civilization that is not vulnerable to attack, you want to put it as far away from Earth as possible. If you have an O'Neill cylinder in low Earth orbit or even in geostationary orbit, it's going to be extremely vulnerable to a nuclear attack if things go south on Earth. Obviously, this is not a scenario that we want to think about, but if we want to become a multi-planetary civilization with the longevity that that means, then we have to be prepared for any scenario. And one of those scenarios, unfortunately, is nuclear war. And nuclear war would definitely threaten anything in Earth orbit, but it would be far, far more difficult to attack anything on Mars, especially when you consider that you only have two launch windows available for a realistic strike. And at the same time, if you launch a missile tens of millions of kilometers away from its target, that gives the Martians a great deal of time to intercept the incoming missile and destroy it before it gets anywhere near their colony. Distance equals security. And one of the most important factors to consider is the matter of feasibility. I mean, look at this damn thing. These things are absolutely colossal. Can you see our civilization actually building something this enormous in orbit in the next hundred years? I really don't. This is a project for the next thousand years, not for the next hundred, simply because we're talking about so much in the way of raw materials. I mean, look, they're growing trees and fields and that sort of thing. You would need to export enormous amounts of soil or at least lunar regolith all the way up to orbit in order to build something like this. And this is only suitable for a million or so people. 
and imagine the immense amount of effort, the immense amount of infrastructure you would have to build, the colossal ships that you would need. I mean, we're talking thousands and thousands of starships would be required in order to transport all of the materials necessary to build something like this. Because as I'm going to discuss here in the future of this video, the matter of in situ resources is a big problem out in space. There are no in situ resources. There are some close by, asteroids, the moon, that sort of thing. But all of that requires that you have rockets that have very large fairings and a lot of mining equipment dispatched out to these locations in order to just mine the raw materials. Then you have to build the structures and everything else that goes with them. It is an engineering task of colossal proportions and not an easy thing to carry out in space when you have to haul all of the raw materials from someplace else utilizing rockets. Yes, the moon is a lot easier because of its low gravity, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be easy, not by any stretch of the imagination. A colony on Mars capable of supporting a million people would would be far easier from a logistical standpoint. And why is this the case? Well, it's a simple matter of in situ resources, as I suggested earlier. It's a lot easier to make use of these resources if you're actually where they are, whereas an O'Neill cylinder is never going to be where these resources are. It's always going to require vast fleets of ships in order to transport the resources to say nothing of manufacturing them into usable forms, for example, turning metal into a superstructure for an O'Neill cylinder is just one of many examples of what you would have to do before you can actually start to assemble it. Whereas on Mars, the whole model behind most of these habitats involves a reusable 3D printer, making use of the resources right where they are, usually basaltic fiber and other substances in order to construct these kinds of habitats. Yes, it isn't as grandiose. It isn't as magnificent as an O'Neill cylinder. It doesn't look as pretty during a presentation, but it's a lot more feasible. If you send perhaps a dozen of these reusable 3D printers to Mars, they could churn out enough habitats and enough structures for a small city in no time making use of resources that are right there. It's just obvious. It's so much simpler to do it this way rather than having to haul the resources off the moon or off of distant asteroids, bringing them into orbit and then trying to assemble them. It's going to be far more expensive especially if we're talking about vast cities. Whereas if you're talking about a modular setup, as is depicted in this particular video, all you have to do is just send more 3D printers and they will manufacture larger and larger cities using resources that are on the spot. That is the whole point of in situ resources and it's a lot harder to make use of them when you're in space. Now, Jeff recognizes this, and he advocates that we build a vast infrastructure on the moon where it's going to be a lot easier to ship the necessary resources out to his O'Neill cylinders. And he correctly points out that the moon has a gravitational well that's 24 times lighter than that of the Earth. That being the case, it's going to be a lot easier to ship the resources. Not simple, but at least a lot easier. And at this point, he went ahead and unveiled his Blue Moon spacecraft, which is very cool in many ways. It is a very sizable lander that runs off of hydrogen and oxygen, which is available in abundance, at least at the south pole of the moon. So we have a vehicle that's capable of making use of in situ fuel, at least, but it's only capable of hauling a few tons off the lunar surface. How many of these would you need in order to build an 
O'Neill cylinder. Thousands? Millions? It's really not that practical. Obviously, this is just a jumping off point, but he really doesn't explain how we're going to take it to the next level. He doesn't have a starship equivalent, and you would certainly need at least something like a starship and probably something way bigger than that in order to start building an O'Neill cylinder. Plus, you would also have to mine the hell out of the moon, which means building an enormous infrastructure on the moon dedicated almost exclusively to mining and manufacturing. Who's going to take care of that infrastructure? Robots? I doubt it. Given the way Amazon is run, I would say that he's probably going to have a permanent underclass working on the moon in order to mine the necessary resources, build the necessary structures that can be carried out to low Earth orbit in order to build the O'Neill cylinders. Think about how much an O'Neill cylinder is probably going to cost. Billions? Trillions of dollars? How are you going to realize a return on your investment with something like that? Well, the best way is to export the uber-rich to these amazing locations. I mean, look how pleasant they are. Look at how idyllic they are. But the only way they're going to exist is if they have a massive infrastructure, probably on the moon, and perhaps asteroid miners as well, supporting them. And this is something we really don't want to see in the future. It's the kind of future that I certainly don't want to see anyway. And yeah, the vast population of an O'Neill cylinder would certainly need ordinary people in order to make it work, from technicians to cooks to God knows what else. But still, it's obvious that the only way to make this profitable would be to export people who have the money to live there. It would be a lot less expensive and obviously a lot less attractive to the uber-rich to build a colony on Mars. Mars is the best way way for us to establish a multi-planetary civilization. I'm not saying that O'Neill cylinders are impossible or they won't exist sometime in the future, but it shouldn't be our first objective. Our first objective in low Earth orbit might better be a solar array so we don't have to cover the entire surface of the planet with solar panels. As I've described in other videos, placing massive solar arrays in orbit might be the solution for our ever-increasing energy needs. But O'Neill cylinders for actual habitation for millions if not billions of people? I don't see that being feasible or even desirable for a long period of time. Like it or not, Mars, for all of its drawbacks, is going to represent the best way of making humanity a multi-planetary species. As far as exporting damaging activities off the planet are concerned, when it comes to heavy industry or large power plants or extensive mining operations, yes, I think Jeff Bezos is absolutely right about those things. We do need to start establishing a mining infrastructure on the moon, perhaps Mars as well. We should also start mining asteroids and we should start establishing solar power arrays in orbit as well. All of these things would help create the blue idyllic paradise that he wants to create without exporting millions of people off of Earth at a tremendous expense. I think that that is unnecessary, unrealistic, and if we just want to establish a multi-planetary civilization, going to Mars, as I've described in this video, is really the best solution by far. Yes, it has its drawbacks. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be cold. It's going to be dangerous, especially with the pressure differential and other problems that exist on the planet and also with one-third gravity there's a very good chance that people who live there for too long or people who are born there are never going to be able to return. Martians are going to have to be a fundamentally different type of human being. A human being that wants to explore the rest of the solar system and they wouldn't be hindered by
by growing up in a one-third gravity environment in order to do that, unless they were going to go to Venus or something crazy like that, but they would never be able to return to Earth. That is a harsh reality, perhaps something that our medical science can resolve in the future, but nevertheless something that we need to consider if we're going to be colonizing Mars. But still, it's a lot more realistic than these vast cities in space that would have to be supported by millions of hardworking people on the moon who would never live to realize the fruit of their labors. That is to say, perhaps a few of them might win some kind of crazy lottery to get a ticket to one of these places, but the vast majority of them would simply end up looking up longingly at a vast station in the sky that they would never be able to live on. And if you think I've been watching a movie that stars Matt Damon a little bit too much lately, think about the numbers. Think about how expensive and how difficult it would be to create something like this and balance that figure against the only people wealthy enough to invest in it. I don't think you'll like the future that comes out at the end of the equation. This is the escape valve that all the critics talk about, whereas Mars most definitely isn't. The only people who are going to go there are the ones who truly believe in living in space and are willing to commit their entire future to it, and that is not the privileged few. By the way, if you're wondering why I'm putting out so much content, it's because tomorrow I'm going to visit my daughter, who's currently interning at a nuclear power plant. I'm hoping to get some very interesting information from her, and I'm going to be putting out content to the best of my ability during this trip. If you'd like to support what I do, please check out the description, or at least please Please like and subscribe to this channel. So until we have a future where there is an infrastructure on the moon, where there are orbital facilities that are really working to the future benefit of mankind and not just a privileged few, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.